Welcome into the Paul Farrington Show. Paul joined alongside Jack Weinberger and Robert Ziggy Ziegler. No producer Zach today, but hopefully he'll be back over the course of uh, the next couple of weeks. You grind summertime, busy busy time in construction and it's concrete. Grinding. When you're uh, when it's hot outside, it's what, what 95 degrees here. Heat waves in New Jersey lately. I don't know how it is in over in LA right now, Ziggy or California. We'll call it just say California. But uh, some pretty pretty hot days here in New Jersey lately. And uh, it's nice. Today was finally the first cool day on this Monday afternoon that we're recording for Tuesday release. Division previews are starting up on the Paul Farrington show. So, I mean, even Jack, look at this. Jack has a computer in front of him with notes. So you I'm, know that it's a it's a big show. Super rare, right? I got my got my laptop here. got some notes down. Usually uh, it's all just stored up in the brain. I, I'm, not, I'm not winging it today. A day like today where we're going over, we're doing the NFC East today. On Thursday, we'll be having uh, the AFC East show dropping so you will you might see us in the same clothes we're recording both of them on the same day here later in the week we're going to have a mailbag come out and in that mailbag episode we'll show who wins the merch giveaway thank you to everyone who joined became a member we now have over 50 members it's awesome we'll be doing the merch giveaway later this week please remember to like comment and subscribe to the channel of course you can become a member for different perks throughout the summer and into next season including merch giveaways we're going to have competitions like um, maybe some people said fantasy football, pick them leagues, whatever it is. We're figuring that out right now. And remember, of course, you can always listen on audio as well. So thank you to everyone who listens on YouTube and the audio side of things. So the NFC East, do you guys remember doing these last year? The division previews is kind of the first time we had videos really start to pop off. And at that time it was what, maybe 500 viewers was big for us back then. Yeah, I mean, what, our Anthony Richardson video, that was our first big video. It got like 600 views and we lost it. Yeah, we were we were so excited. And the, the division previews, we finally started to get a taste of like all right, 500, maybe 1,000 views. And that was the first, uh, first time we really were thinking, okay, we could maybe have some success here. So we're going to follow the same format as we did last year. The way we did it, we broke down each team, a quick discussion of each of them. Then we're going to get into the non-quarterback player to watch the preseason division MVP, and finally our predictions for the division for the 2024 season. We'll start off, and the way we did it last year, we gave each team sort of its own little billing. So we had the the top contender, uh, then the challenger, the sleeper, and the bottom feeder. That's how we did it last year. So in terms of the NFC East, what we're going to say, and maybe someone disagrees, but what we have right now as the top team in the NFC East, the Dallas Cowboys heading into the 2024 season. And when we talk about the Cowboys off season, the main thing we're talking about is nothing. They've just they haven't done anything. That's uh, it's like Seinfeld, a show about nothing and off season about nothing for the Cowboys. They didn't resign Dak. They didn't resign Micah Parsons, didn't resign CD lamb. All the prices are going up really no big free agent signings. And when Jerry Jones is saying this team is all in the attitude and the actions of the Cowboys haven't really seen to support that. Oh, hold see. on, hold on. No big free agents. Are you forgetting Minnesota Vikings legend <laughs> no. Eric Kendricks? You know what's funny? Eric Kendricks, so so the key additions to the team, if we're going to say, Eric Kendricks, Ezekiel Elliott, they joined. They they uh, drafted... Royce Freeman. Guyton. Royce Freeman. <laughs> they drafted Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma at left tackle. Which actually, you know, potential there in that pick. Um, Eric Kendricks is one of the additions. I was really surprised to see that because I don't know if you guys saw when Eric Kendricks or when Mike Zimmer left Minnesota, when he was fired, Eric Kendricks was one of the first guys to speak out. And he said, it feels so free around here. People aren't walking on their tiptoes anymore. And to see him go back with Mike Zimmer, I was a little surprised because I thought that that relationship had soured, but apparently, I, I guess not with him returning. Was oh, that a diss towards Minnesota? It was a diss towards Zimmer. When Zimmer left like Minnesota, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric Kendricks was like, oh, people can finally breathe around here again. Because Zimmer, you know, he's a cranky, crankier guy um, when it comes to coaching. All right, and then he goes back. And then he went back to him yeah. now with da- at Dallas uh, as the defensive well, coordinator. Spot. Spot. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, that was the best football you saw Eric Kendricks play. Um, and then losses for Dallas this offseason. They lose Tony Pollard. They lose Tyron Smith. Dorrance Armstrong had a, had a good season. He's gone. Uh, Leighton Van Der Esch retired. Stephon Gilmore's gone. Jonathan Hankins went to the Seahawks. So a lot more losses than gains for this team who's trying to get over the hump finally. So the, the key question we have here is, is Dallas good enough to win the Super Bowl as is? Or do you guys think the inactivity is going to cost them when they haven't, you know, they haven't made the NFC Championship game since 1995? See, give me a roll tide. Give me a roll tide, Ziggy. 
<laughs> the, the T is a lowercase, but roll tide. Um, so yeah, I, this it's not a question for me of if whether or not Dallas's lack of of doing much is what's going to hurt them. Uh, the side of the ball that that would for that occasion is because Philly had a good off season, and there's a world, actually a very clear world, where Philly win this division this year, and Dallas is a five oh, yeah, six. Sure. Uh, but Dallas, this team was was a number two seed in the playoffs. I know so they they lost a lot of pieces, which they did. But this is a team who was eight and zero at home. Uh, like talent across the board. It's a contract year now for Dak. You look at their schedule this year too. A lot of their their tougher opponents, teams like Cincinnati, Baltimore, uh, the Lions, Texans, etc. They host them in a stadium where they're where they're they play well. They're not on the road. A team like Philly's on the road. So I don't think uh, talent wise, I don't think they're much worse than they'll be last year. They were twelve and five division champs. Uh, it's just a matter of teams like Philly having gotten better. Mm-hmm. But Dallas is capable of, be, of 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 playing in the Super Bowl. Like they're good enough, and they have in the last couple of years. It's just a matter of whether or not they choke in the playoffs again. But their lack of like their lack of not having a super active off season for me will not be the death is not going to be like what stops them from being a Super Bowl contender. Like they still are. Okay. But I guess not what's what's keeping them. Well, you don't need to have an off active off season like a team like the Falcons did if you've already got the players at home. I know people are unhappy, but Dak has to be one of the best quarterbacks in the NFC. CD Lame is one of the best wide receivers in the NFC. Micah Parsons is one of the best edge rushers in the NFC. Now they've sort of moved him down there. One of the best defensive players. Trayvon Diggs, one of the best playmakers defensively in the NFC. They have a lot of really good players. And while it's not great that they haven't really added anybody, if you've got one of the best quarterbacks, one of the best receivers, and some of the best playmaking defenders, you can absolutely win the Super Bowl, even though it's been really disappointing to watch them for the past few years. Yeah, they can still get there. Like, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think most people, most reasonable people would look at the Cowboys and say, this is like this is still a Super Bowl contending team. Again, when you talk about the Cowboys, most people are not reasonable. So, you know, when you're thinking about the national media or even just, you know, general people reacting to Cowboys news, it's always going to have a negative spin on it. We don't really exactly feel that way. But what I will say is that the offseason has been very disappointing. It hasn't been debilitating, but yeah, you would have liked to see them go out and address running back. They're kind of testing the Jack's theory of running backs don't really matter. Just plug and play. Zeke's not going to come in and be a huge difference maker. Linebacker, I like, again, I we're, we like Kendricks because he's a former Viking, but Kendricks is He's washed. He was not good last year. At this year. point in coverage, he used to be great in coverage. And now I just remember him getting torched against the Rams on Thursday night football. This was like four years ago too. So he he's fallen off a cliff. Didn't really address your defensive tackle issues. Uh, to me, if you're if you want to be a contender, like go assert yourself, make some noise, make some splashes. It doesn't have to be the biggest guys in the world, but I, I think losing is a disease. And to overcome that hurdle, you really need to avoid all distractions. You need everyone brought in. And when they haven't done anything this offseason, they left Dak out to dry. They left CD Lamb out to dry. They left Parsons out to dry. McCarthy and Jerry Jones now. All the reports are how they don't get along. To me, the things that need to happen for Dallas to take that next step are not happening. And that's what would scare me as a Cowboys fan is that they're just like, yeah, they are talented enough to win, but there's just so many distractions already when nothing's happened that that gets me a little bit nervous. Especially that 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 Philly now had a great offseason. Philly well. had a great offseason. Like Philly had the best offseason of any team in the league. Yeah, other than and, maybe and you guys. The other, yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah, it's close. And then so, Dallas goes out and does nothing, which is which is a concern, because there's a huge and I'm, uh, like there's a huge difference in in a two or three C versus a five or a six. Philly, like Philly's making all these moves, Dallas is not. Dallas has the talent to win the Super Bowl, but if you're a five or a six seed instead of a two or a three, that's that much harder. And the, and we they haven't been to the NFC Championship game. We all know for thirty, 30 years. years. Yeah, if you go on the road to San Francisco, even if they win the wild card round. Like that's a game that they haven't been able to win for for years. Yeah, so they're going to have to win a lot of regular season games, and I worry particularly about that wide receiver room. You know, they've had really good injury luck with CD Lamb. He's played seventeen games the past two seasons. But if anything happens to him, you know, Brandon Cooks is getting old. 
Tolbert is totally unproven, and there's nobody behind those guys. If anything happens to C.D. Lamb this year, the offense could get very sour very quickly. And one one last thing before we move on to the next team here. Uh, uh, Jack, you mentioned how Dak, which really for this team, I agree with you. It's kind of overcoming that mental hurdle and showing up in the playoffs. Dak here, I mean, last season, 4,500 yards, 36 touchdowns, nine interceptions, second in MVP. He was best in the league. He was awesome. He He was great. And then in the playoffs, remember that first half of the Packers game? 87 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions, a 47.2 passer rating, 27 nothing hole, completely outdueled by Jordan Love. Yes, the Packers were were playing really good football at the time, but still, that's an unacceptable performance for Dak. And, and I think Dak Prescott would be the first one to admit it. Ziggy brought up how it's we could sometimes be a little unfair to Dak because just two years ago, he had one of the best games of his career in the playoffs when he ended Tom Brady's career with a four-touchdown performance in Tampa. So... I, I don't necessarily think it's all it's all about not showing up in the playoffs. It's just been a couple games here or there where yeah, Dak has had a, unfortunately has had a bad game in the spotlight, and that's cost Dallas. So yeah, we all agree the team is good enough to win, but they just got to show up when it matters. I mean, what they've won twelve games two or th- three years in a row now, is it? Yeah, I mean they were all at home last year. I didn't lose so at home. we'll we'll see where uh and lost where that play takes them. Years. The top challenger to the Cowboys, as Jack alluded to here, the Philadelphia Eagles, who had yeah, a really good offseason. They, they always seem, at least the perception of the Philly offseasons are so often okay. Like, they load it up, and we've said this before, it seems like they always do the obvious thing, whether that's in the draft or whether that's you know trading for big-time players. They're very star-oriented in their moves, which to guys like, like us and the general fan, that's very attractive. Like, like when you go trade for AJ Brown, you're like, okay, like I, I like that move. If I'm a Philly fan, it's easy to get behind that. So their key additions this offseason, they add Saquon Barkley, Cooper DeGene, and Quinion Mitchell were their two draft picks. Their first two cornerbacks, again, guys who most people thought fell in the draft. They added Devin White, as Jack so uh, articulately pointed out before we started the recording today, which Ziggy said does not matter. CJ Gardner Johnson's back. Bryce Huff coming over from the Jets, and then. It's the second straight year now where they've changed both their offensive and defensive coordinators. Kellen Moore comes over and Vic Fangio as well to lead the defense. Uh, key losses, Jason Kelsey's gone. Hassan Reddick's gone. Fletcher Cox retired. DeAndre Swift is out. Kevin Byard's out. They extended A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. Both of them got pretty massive deals, $32 million a year for A.J. and $25 million for Devontae. They also extended a couple linemen in Landon Dickerson and Jordan Mailata. So, like this team, this team has star power all over the place, guys. It's just a matter now. The key question we have for Philly: Will we see an Eagles team that's closer? Do they resemble more of that Super Bowl team from two years ago, or the team that fell apart last season? A lot of new faces, but which way, if you had to pick, will that will this team be more similar to? I just did watch a, a movie called Silver Linings Playbook with Bradley Cooper. Is that good? And it was a good movie. I yeah. never watched. And uh, they're big Eagles fans. He has a Deshaun Jackson jersey. So it got me hyped for uh for football season. Who's it, Jennifer Lawrence? Yeah, Jennifer Lawrence is is the co uh, the co star in that movie. But it's a good movie. But they're big Eagles fans, big Philly sports fans. Uh, so I was kind of I was kind of hyped for the season. You're in an Eagles I mood. I was in an Eagles mood. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I <laughs> I'm gonna lean more so what we saw uh, when they went to the Super Bowl. I mean, this Eagles team. Bye bye bye. I am gonna buy this Eagles team collapsed very hard. And there's there's no denying that they're one of the worst teams in football for the whole second half of the season. And even with that collapse, pro- Hurts playing probably the worst he could have played. He was banged up, turning the ball over. It was so bad, so bad. Dallas going eight and zero at home, and the Eagles having that stretch. They finished one game behind Dallas in the NFC East. I think Dallas played probably the best they could have, and Philly probably played the worst that they could have. And there was a one game difference. And the main killer last year to Philly was in their defense. It was bad cornerback play from Darius Slay and, uh, and, Bradbury. and yeah, declined big time. Worse than we thought. Bad linebacker play. It was on the defensive side, along with Jalen Hurst turning the ball over. But now you go out and you get, like you said, Bryce Hoff from the Jets. New face is Devin White, who I think he's a, I know Ziggy said it doesn't matter. I think he's a good, li- <laughs> I think he's a good linebacker. Uh, Saquon Barkley. The offense has no issues. I love the Barkley. Like, like, the offense really has no issues. If Jalen Hurst can just hold on to the ball. 
is on the defensive side of the ball. You got two top 40 draft picks. No reason to think they're not going to pan out. A lot of new faces, but I'm going to lean that this is a, a team with just way too much talent on both ends to see a repeat of last year's collapse. Like I'm going to say this team wins 11 or 12 games and looks good as opposed to looks mediocre and stumbles into the playoffs. How about you, Ziggy? I mean, Devin White really is. He's the story of this team. He is, He's really talented. He put together a lot of good years. And then the 2023 season, he just had unbelievable mental error after unbelievable mental error and looked like one of the worst players in the entire NFL anytime he had to play run defense. On the other hand, though, the Eagles are hoping they can turn it around. And like Jack said, I do think there's some reason to be optimistic about that. You know, defensive performance in the NFL is up and down. It's not as consistent as fans think. I like some of the new faces they brought in. Bryce Huff fits in really well of the way the Eagles love to rotate defenders, despite only playing, well, like 40% of the snaps for the Jets last year. He had 10 sacks, so he'll fit in really well of that role. I like moving on from Hassan Reddick and putting him in. But it all comes down to one player. And that one player just is going to be Jalen Hurts. He has to be better. Now, the offense wasn't great around him. The coordinating wasn't great. There were a lot of problems there. But when you're a star quarterback with the deal he has for the Philadelphia Eagles, the responsibility is on you, especially when he's got all those weapons around him. Now, I know the offensive line got a little bit worse, but it should still be one of the better offensive lines in football. You've got Saquon coming in to juice up the run game. You've got maybe the best wide receiver duo in the NFL. He has to perform. And while I think he can, he's going to have to do a better job mentally than he did last year. It's tough, too. A lot of people haven't talked about Shane Steichen leaving. Shane Steichen took a Colts team that went 4-12-1, and lost their rookie quarterback, and had Gardner Minshew leading the way. And we like, like Gardner Minshew's good, but you know, he's, he, there's a reason he's a backup. That team was, what, a, a couple passes away from going to the playoffs. Shane Steichen has proven to be one of the better coaches in football. And Brian Johnson came in last year. And it was a lot, even from someone who's not watching Philly every single week, you could tell it's like, okay, they're just running like inside zone every single time that DeAndre, I was a DeAndre Swift fantasy owner and I'm going, the play calling in Philly is like pretty, un, it's not really that creative, kind of lackluster. And, it's like Steelers. And then no, it, and it carried over throughout much of the season. Um, so hopefully you're hoping that Kellen Moore can come in and spark that creativity that they had a couple of years ago and you get that MVP Jalen Hurts back. Uh, I, I'm with you guys. I think there's just too much talent. The offensive side of the ball is phenomenal. It's uh, Yeah, you're right. As long as Jalen Hurts holds on to the football, I think they'll be fine. But when you look at the defensive collapse, it was like, it, I mean, guys, it is, it is just stunning what happened. They went from 2022 eighth in points per game allowed, first in passing yards allowed, to 30th in points allowed last year, 31st in passing yards allowed. I mean, they, they legitimately went from arguably the best defense in football to the worst over the course of a season, and they still started off 10-1. and one. It was just that, I mean, the end of season collapse was just crazy. I don't know if you guys saw, I was just looking at comparisons throughout the season, and the edge rushers, so here's here are just some numbers to support it that I, I thought were just shocking. In 2022, 38 sacks for their edge rushers. They started off last year through nine games, 16 sacks, four and a half through the final eight games for all their edge rushers. Josh, Josh Sweat, zero sacks the final eight games. Hassan Reddick, one game with a sack from week 10 on. Jordan Davis had zero sacks, zero tackles for loss, zero QB hits from week from the game eight on. It was like everybody just fell off a cliff. And I you kind of sit back and just go like, go, like this, something must have happened in that locker room. I don't know what it was, but there was something bizarre must have gone on because these are really good football players. And all of them at the same time, it seemed like they just lost faith in their team. I mean, they got blown out by the 49ers and Dallas and back-to-back -back games. They're the, the first team ever to lose back-to-back 20-point -back games after going to a Super Bowl the year before. Like, I, I think there's some story from the Philadelphia, the 2023 Philadelphia Eagles that maybe hasn't come to light where, it, I don't know, it was just bizarre to see such a good team fall that far from grace. Maybe they're betting against themselves. <laughs> I mean, maybe they, like, I, I, it, was, it was so bad that maybe possible. maybe they were. I, I mean, <laughs> call up a friend, call up a relative, do a few few grand on uh, Dallas, San Francisco. Through week 10, number one versus the run, 66 yards per game allowed. The next seven games, 31st in the NFL. Sus. 80 more yards per game. Like, 
I don't understand. It wasn't like they got ravaged by injuries the way the Dolphins did. I mean, it was. It's also too. It's like the the talent that team had, and to end their season losing by thirty to the Bucks in the playoffs, it, it was just outrageous. <laughs> My dad bet on the the Eagles to beat the Bucks, and he just. I was talking to him about this show, and he went, "Man, what a sucker bet that was!" Like, well, I was all over the Bucks tonight. Yeah, yeah, I mean the the Eagles. They weren't as good as the team that went ten and one. They weren't as good as they weren't as bad as the team that had that end of season collapse. So the key this year, I think, is we're talking about that huge up and that huge down and the way they felt so swingy emotionally. They're just going to have to play steady. And if they play steady with this schedule, you know, we've got them second in the division, but they can easily win. Oh, they can easily win the Super Bowl. I mean, we said on the the show, the expectations for Philly should still be Super Bowl. But yeah, those first 11 games, it did feel like they were escaping. If you go back in hindsight, they were escaping games more than they were winning them. And well, we said that on the show, and people yeah. said it was not a fluke. They were an elite team. We were being super haters. Yeah, so, so they just got to pull it together because, yeah, the talent is there. Defense has to step up, and I think with all the additions, they did bring in some younger guys. Like That secondary could be really good if it all clicks, if it all gels, and by maybe by midseason, you see DeGene and, hey, and Mitchell get it, come into their own. That's two first round caliber corners they got in the first. Yeah. Year. And Huff's a younger guy than Reddick. Like, so there is some, I mean, Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis, it's a matter of them lasting throughout the season. As we just said, they, they fell off cliffs, but a lot of young talent on that defense, while there is still a veteran presence, I think they will be fine, but it was, it was just shocking going through it. Um, and Nick Sirianni, there's even questions about how good of a coach he is. So let's move on to our, sleeper in the NFC East, the Washington Commanders, and a lot, a lot of changes for the Commanders. Another team, for all the inactivity Dallas had, Washington made up for it, basically, on their own. They added uh, Nick Allegretti, the guard, Austin Eckler, Dorrance Armstrong comes over from the Cowboys we mentioned, Dante Fowler Jr., Cleland F- Farrell, Bobby Wagner, frankly, Frankie Louvu were two big names. I always mess up the pronunciation of the Cowboy Center, uh, Biadas, like, like I can never, I can never say. I don't know why. It's just for some reason they pulled over the Cowboys center, and then uh, Dan Quinn, Cliff Kingsbury, and Joe Witt are all new to the coaching staff. Key losses here. The big one to me was Kendall Fuller. Uh, you lose him in the secondary, so there are some questions there. But yeah, this Washington team: three new starters on offense, five new starters on defense. Is it crazy to believe that Jaden Daniels and this very new cast can be successful in year one? I mean, it depends what you view as uh, successful for them. What would you view, like playoffs or? No, I, I would just say be, having a competitive football team, maybe get to, get to like eight wins. I think Jaden Daniels has a very high ceiling. Uh, and the additions to this defense was huge because this defense last year was piss poor. Defense got a lot. Like, yeah, like this was one of the worst defenses in football, super below average. Defense got a lot better. To me, if you can play decent 500 level football, show your teams trending in the right direction, like Jaden Daniels can so sh- can show some some flashes, show some things of what he could be if he could if uh you know what they're expecting him to be down the road. The defense can improve. This team can win eight or so games, which I think is very possible. That's a good season. There's always that world where you know it's a. Uh, it could be that that, that CJ Stroud rookie year Texans like team that shouldn't be expected. Oh no no you like, can't expect. Yeah like when you're an obvious third third team in the division, your ceiling is probably the seven seed in the playoffs. Wait isn't isn't Ziggy high? Wait, are you high on the Commander? I know you're high on Arizona. But are you high on the Commander? I'm I'm not especially high on the Commanders, but I do okay. remember the last time they took a quarterback number two overall. What happened? E, a great rookie season. <laughs> yeah. yeah, immediate divisional title out yeah. of nowhere. So I, I it, it can uh, happen. The you go ahead. Yeah, the thing the thing that I worry about with this team, and this is just Jaden Daniels' question, because really it's up to him how far this team goes. I think the defense will be average or slightly above average. At LSU, every single week, basically, he had an enormous advantage at skill positions. Right? They were going in with some of the best receivers in college football, great run game, great coordinating at LSU basically every year. And that's why for the two years he was there, he was so much better than at Arizona State. You're not getting that luxury of the commanders. Uh, Terry McLaurin, a lot of people have forgotten about him, but he's good. But he's not an elite wide receiver. 
Dotson hasn't lived up to very much. Luke McCaffrey, I mean, he might be a decent slot receiver. No one knows. Austin Eckler is incredibly washed. He's not going to be very good for this team. So the question just is, I is Jaden okay Daniels a product? Eckler. He will ask any Chargers fan. He was so bad last year. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm the sorry. Que- the, the, que- the question is just going to be, can Jaden Daniels, he doesn't need to elevate people around him, but will he hold the team back as a rookie? I don't know what it will be, but if he can at least play to the level of talent around him, it's a 500 team. Well, do you think the team might hold him back? Sounds like you're very I good don't, Washington. <laughs> I mean, I think there's decent players on this team, right? The defense is okay. Terry McLaurin is a decent player. Dotson, while he's been disappointing, is not a bad player. He could have a good season when there's finally someone decent throwing him the ball. The question just is, like, I don't think Jaden Daniels will be good enough his rookie season to be held back by this talent. Long term, you need more, right? But so, like, yeah, Caleb Williams and and JJ McCarthy. I think that the Bears and Vikings are good enough to elevate them next season. Like, there's a lot of talent on that team. Whereas Bo Nix and Denver, I don't, I don't like what's going on in Denver right now. Drake May in Drake May in New England. New I, England. You know, we'll talk about that on Thursday. I'm not a huge fan of what's going on there. So, do, which which side would you say? the Jaden Daniels situation is closer to. I think Jaden Daniels is dead in the middle. The talent will not elevate him, but the talent won't hold him back either. So I think he's in exactly the third best landing spot. You know, I'm not excited about Cliff Kingsbury. I'm not excited about what he's going to bring, but it's better than what the Patriots have. You know, I'm not especially excited about the skill position players, but they're real NFL players. It's better than what he'll have in Denver. where We'll have eight games of Cortland Sutton and whoever else. So, yeah, I think that he has a chance to play well, but the reason that they're not higher and the reason they're not lower than Daniel Jones, who has at least shown he can have a productive NFL season, is because I do think, Daniels, there's something there. I will say this to people who haven't, you know, who haven't really paid attention to the Washington offseason so far. If you were to if someone said, yeah, Washington has a shot at making the playoffs this year, they'd probably just start laughing and say, like, you're an idiot. But the more you dive in, to what they did like, like I think Bobby Wagner and Frankie Luvu uh, I think they still got some in the tank like like Bobby Wagner I mean Luvu obviously but Bobby Wagner was great last season for large portions of last season like I see no reason why that linebacking unit isn't going to perform at a high level we all know that the defensive line is very good in Washington especially the defensive tackles the concerns for me are on the back end you're going to need a lot from Emmanuel Forbes next season and then on the offensive line, where one of the big needs for Washington was offensive line, and they did add some people, but there wasn't it wasn't addressed in the way that most fans would have, would have liked, especially for a rookie quarterback, especially a quarterback like Jaden Daniels. You know, smaller frame, took a lot of big hits at LSU. He's going to run a lot, doesn't really know when to slide, it seems. So there are definitely concerns with those areas of the roster for me. But if Jan- Daniels is good, doesn't have to be RG3 good, but if he's, you know, in a, a good quarterback next season, I think Washington, believe it or not, could like flirt with that seven seed throughout the, throughout the season. I'm not sure I'm totally buying the Daniels hype, but yeah, like Ziggy said, if he's good, this team ha- is more talented than people realize. Oh, if, if, if he's good and the defense can just take a step to being average... This yeah. could be a number seven seed. Yeah. So yeah. we'll and we'll have to we'll, we just have to see how that offensive line holds up because if people are coming at him, he starts taking hits. I can see it falling apart quick. But there's a world in wh- where the Commanders coming into the later portion of the season are very competitive for a playoff spot. The last team, the bottom feeder here, and then we'll have to see. You know, bottom feeder is always going to sound so mean, and and that's really not what this show is about. But in terms of this, I'll be mean to the Giants. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, in terms of the for lack of a better term, for lack of the bottom feeder, uh, so so it's actually some big additions this yeah. offseason for the Giants. They had Malik Neighbors in the draft. Brian Burns comes over from Carolina. Uh, they add in John Runyon. Like there are some nice pieces that were added to this Giants team. On the other hand, you know Saquon Barkley is just a massive loss when <laughs> when you when you look at guys who have been their basically their entire team's offense. Saquon Barkley is one of the guys who jumps out to mind. I remember watching him in that playoff game in Minnesota two years ago. I mean, he just affects the game in so many different ways. And then Xavier McKinney left for the Packers, as all the Packers fans who watch this show joyously celebrated that one. Um, The offensive line on this team has been an issue for a long time. 
And they did bring in a couple guys, to, uh, but I'm still not totally sold on that unit. I mean, you just take a look. Like Evan Neal has been a complete disaster since he <laughs> since he entered the league. Um, the big question that we're going to have here is for Daniel Jones again, suspect offensive line, really not much in the running game. Who's who's the running back right now? Is it? Um, I was going to say like I was gonna, you know I was about to say, I was about to say Shane Vereen. No, <laughs> <laughs> who's the Giants running back? Is it? I don't even. Did know. they bring in? Um, Devin Singletary. 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I couldn't. Eric get Gray is number two. I was like, yeah. wait a minute, Shane Vereen. So yeah, yeah, Devin Singletary, and then yeah, Malik Neighbors and a bunch of you know more so backups on this on this team here. Will do you guys think Daniel Jones will be able to step up in, in the absence of Saquon Barkley when the rest of that offense leaves a lot? I mean, Darren Waller retired. Like, there's so much to be desired for that Giants offense. Well, hold on, hold on. You're talking about Daniel Jones stepping up without Saquon Barkley. Daniel Jones couldn't step up with Saquon Barkley. Well, I'm wondering if like, that, 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 that's the, that's the reason I'm bit negative on this team. It's not because of who they lost or who they gained. It's because of who they kept. As long as Daniel Jones is the quarterback for your team, set aside the injury history, which is increasingly worrying. The guy has only thrown over 20 touchdowns once, and that was his rookie season. Since then, he's thrown 11, 10, 15, and 2. That is not a guy that you can count on to win games, no matter what his contract says. Uh, look, I, I, I'm not going to come out here and vehemently disagree with you. I'm just posing the question saying, now that he has, you're hoping Malik Neighbors can be that difference making receiver. I, I see. I put myself in a bad position now, where I'm arguing for for the Giants n- next season. But we did see big jumps for for Josh Allen, for Joe Burrow. It was young later or earlier in their careers than Daniel Jones is right now. But to a huge jump after Tyree Kill came, if Malik Neighbors can live up to that billing as a true number one receiver, he's the best receiver that Daniel Jones has ever had by a wide margin. I mean, I mean, he's been throwing to no one basically his entire career in New York. Again, I'm not buying it. I think I think they're going to move on from him after this season and they, and they should. But if you're going to try and find some silver linings as a Giants fan, it's OK. He's got his best weapon at the receiver position ever. Maybe that can help elevate his game. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not high in this team in the slightest at all. I see him four and 13, five and 12. Uh, but I mean, Saquon Barkley is the lone, the lone running back who I've said goes against my my running back theory. Like, I just think he's so incredible. Oh, uh, and McCaffrey should. I, I, for me, Barkley's better. <laughs> but, but like, what, what Barkley did to bail these guys out in so many, like, he was their only source of life on this offense for years, even despite having a bad O line. He's that, the best receiver. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, he was literally the, the only source of offense this team had. It, it was crazy. It, it, yeah. With that being said, the last four seasons, this Giants O-line has finished in the bottom three in the NFL. It's been one of the worst in the NFL for for, for a while. Daniel Jones pretty much his whole career. Uh, now they get Andrew Thomas back, right? He's, he's, he should be back. Andrew uh, Thomas it will be back. They get John Runyon. They get, uh, who else did they get? Aaron, uh, yeah, uh, Illuminor, Stenny. Uh, you you give Daniel Jones his best receiver he's ever had in league neighbors if he can pan out. So the Giants did what they could to help Daniel Jones to the best of his abilities, despite losing Saquon Barkley. I don't think it's nearly enough. I think the offensive line being, which should be okay, and a rookie receiver. They do still have Evan Neal. <laughs> like, I mean, like the I, so they still have Evan Neal starting, and they still have John Michael Schmitz starting. Like, just I mean, just for, like, for Giants, Giants fans are going to be like, we know this, but for non-Giants fans, Evan Neal's PFF grade was 39.8 in 2023, a pass blocking grade of 38.5. John Michael Schmitz, 41.4 PFF grade with a 26.9 pass blocking grade. <laughs> I mean, that's like, like, like it's hard. It's, it's hard to get so mad at Daniel Jones. I, I don't, we don't think he's that great, but it's hard to really harp on him this much when that's his offensive line. And he has no weapons. The last, it's like, what are you going to do? The last four years, they finished bottom four in the lead in the offensive line. The, the offensive line can't block. It's horrible. So, I mean, no, like, I mean, yeah. Evan Neal, he let, a pre- he let Daniel Jones get pressured on 10% of his pass block snaps. <laughs> like, they did. Like, they have some additions, as we said, but to have maybe what, at best, a, an okay offensive line 
And I mean, you gotta hope those guys don't just like they have to. They have to improve. Like, yeah, like what? But at the best, probably an okay O line and relying on a rookie receiver to to be your your security blanket. I don't think DJ is good enough where that's going to make a huge difference for him. Yeah, I think they'll struggle on the offensive side a lot next season. I mean, defense they could be top ten in a few categories, but like offense, I, I their defensive see. line is great. Yeah, between between Burns, Thibodeau, and Dexter Lawrence, I mean that might be the best. That's up there for one of the best defensive in lines league. in the entire league. Bobby Okarike. Um, I always think of the McAfee when uh, the McAfee read when he was drafted. He had 149 tackles last year. He was awesome. Yeah, uh, you do need some guys on the back end, especially with the loss of McKinney, to to grow a little bit. But you know, maybe Deontay Banks takes a, a jump in year two. So some secondary issues for the Giants, but that's generally a defense that should. I mean, that should be a competitive defense. Uh, if you get any life out of the offense, they like. I I don't see why they can't be okay. But I we just don't. Ex- I don't expect them to to be a threat I, at offense. I, I see. On, a, I, I see a ceiling of like six wins. Yeah, I, the I, trajectory. I yeah, the so trajectory I expect for this team is I think what they're going to be doing, they don't look like it right now, but with the way they've played this offseason, they let some guys walk. They signed playmakers who were very young, right? I mean, you can't forget Brian Burns is only 26. So my guess is they're getting ready to get take another quarterback, hope that they've had some development from some of the guys they've drafted, and start over again next year. That's how I sort of see this going. Same. And while that's not exciting for this year, Giants fans have plenty to look forward to. And that's not a bad thing, right? To have a plan with some exciting young players, guys you're ready to watch, letting some expensive veterans go. That's the best you can do after you hand out this Daniel Jones contract. So hopefully that's what we see from them going into next season. But for now, I expect pain. All right. So a couple quick categories here before we close out today's show. The non-quarterback player to watch next season. Do you have a guy, Jack, in the Mm -hmm. NFC East? Non QB player to watch. Ziggy, you go first. You go first. I got a couple. For me, the player that I'm most interested in is Micah Parsons, but I think the non quarterback player to watch is CD Lamb. I know those are both Cowboy players, but as I said when we were talking about the Cowboys a little bit earlier, CD Lamb is the key to this Cowboys offense. If he has an elite season, Dak Prescott, with all the throwing he's going to be doing, will have one of the best seasons of his career. If CD Lamb does not healthy or does not have a good season, there's nobody on this Cowboys team that's going to be able to bail Dak out, and the running game won't help either. So I think that he that does have player a lot of weight on his shoulders, yeah, you know, like CD Lamb has more weight on him, I think, than any other player at any other position in this division, excluding quarterback. I I, I got a couple of mine, but I'll probably go. Uh, I'm gonna go Malik Neighbors. I think the numbers he could put up are are pretty wild. I really? I think <laughs> After what I we just said about the Giants. Well, I mean, I think he'll get. He's t- the only option. Yeah, he'll, he'll get 15 targets a game. Uh, I think he'll be force fed. He's probably the best receiver they've had since Odell. Uh, you're hoping. Uh, he's got you're, you're hoping. <laughs> but I'm, I mean, I'm, the, I'm curious yeah. to see like the what, how he is and what he does. But drafted number six, uh, high expectations, very good receiver. I'm, I want to see what his numbers are like. I think they're with the mediocre quarterback. There are a lot of fun players. M- Micah Parsons does always jump out to mind, Ziggy, but I- I'll go a different route than him as well. I think you could also take a look. I'm not going to do a Cowboy, but um, Trayvon Diggs' return is going to be big for the Cowboys, especially after losing Gilmore. And you got to hope Deron Bland can you know, somewhat emulate what he did last season. The Cowboys' corners, I'm really excited to watch. Uh, for Washington, it would be Bobby Wagner. I really want to see how he. Ca- I like he'll be essentially captaining that defense. Um, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to Philly, and I'm gonna go with the two rookies. I'm gonna say Mitchell and Cooper DeGene. I know it's one player to watch. No, you get to pick one. Pick oh my one. Gosh. All right, Quinion Mitchell. I'll say Quinion Mitchell then. I uh, his his role is gonna be big because the James Bradbury basically like retirement tour last season was just horrendous for Philly. Um, and Darius Slay is only getting older too. So I think Quinion Mitchell coming in, if the Philly secondary is just horrible, you're going to be relying a lot on that defensive line because the linebackers are okay there. Um, but that defensive line is going to have a lot of pressure on them to generate pressure if they can't lock anyone up. And Quinion Mitchell is going to take on a lot of that responsibility early, like er- early in his career as a rookie. Um, same thing with Cooper DeGene. So the Philly secondary to me, the preseason division MVP. I'm going to go with Dak again. He was just so good in the regular season last year. I think it would be kind of foolish to take anyone else other than Jalen Hurts. I mean, Saquon could be 
amazing too. I see. It's either Dak or Hurts. I'd probably go Dak as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Dak is going to throw more times this season. Well, you don't need to be leading the Dak Prescott Express. He is going to throw more times this season than any other time in his career. They can't run the ball. He's going to have (laughs) 650 or more (laughs) passes. You're right. That's right. right. You don't have. You don't have to. MVP stat driven. He's got a stat pad this year, Dak. (laughs) But he'll have to. I mean, so like freaking. Can't you see the the Giants being like five and twelve and neighbors having sixteen hundred yards? <laughs> no, I really can't. No, <laughs> I can't. Do you realize how many yards for sixteen hundred is? I think I've only got twenty targets again. There, there are there are five MVP candidates in in the in the NFC East. It's Micah. It's CD. It's Dak. It's Jalen Hurts. It's Saquon Barkley. And Malik Neighbors. Those are, those are MVP candidates. I, I mean, I, I think Neighbors could be awesome. You could have two thousand yards. Um, let's let's finish off here with predictions there's the eye roll or the NFC. there's the eye roll yeah. you always get an it was, eye roll at it was some bound point. to come at some point uh, I'm gonna oh, that's go, a, a rookie court yeah. I'm gonna actually stick with that that order there I'm gonna say Cowboys Eagles Commanders Giants and that December 29th game in Philadelphia that's the one to circle where I, I could see the Eagles and Cowboys both being around 10 or 11 wins at that time maybe 9 and, and they're going for the division title yeah I'm gonna say I'm gonna go Cowboys Eagles Commanders Giants as well Break the trend, Ziggy. I want to take this Eagles team a lot because I think there's a lot of upside here. And like Jack said, it felt like the Cowboys executed really well last year and the Eagles sort of didn't. Nevertheless, I'm going to go chalk here. Cowboys, Eagles, Commanders, Giants. All right, there you have it. The first of eight division preview episodes. I think that's pretty good. All things considered, guys. I, pretty, pretty good oh, job there. Good, like, yeah. like last well, year, we, we were easily able to get off the rails. I think that was... For the most well, part, kept on the track. Let's the comments. Say. Gonna, they, 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 I will say for folks, though, I think this is going to be the only division where we agree on the ranking of every team. Yeah. Like all three of us in total agreement, that almost never that happens. Very rarely that occurs. Very rare, which, 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 means, which means it's guaranteed it doesn't finish that order. To the, run to FanDuel and bet on the Eagles to win the division. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Dallas is the favorite plus 120, right? Philly's probably plus 200 something, 300 is, something. No, they're, they're closer. Oh, are they closer? What do you have the odds in front of you, Ziggy? Yeah, so the Cowboys are one twenty, the Eagles are one thirty. Fan. Oh, I, okay, okay, yeah. So, and then Giants and Commanders are both a thousand. Okay, yeah. So the two, Giants, the two, the two Giants should be worse than a thousand. That's not even worth it. All right, thanks everyone for listening. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Of course, you can become a member by going to our channel homepage and clicking join. And we're gonna have the AFC East coming out on Thursday. We'll see you next time.